Wikipedia. Hey, what's up, y'all? This is The Stream. Welcome to the pre-show. This is where we have a chance to talk about some of the things that are in the news, a few things that have come across our radar. Before we get into the meat of the broadcast, after the main show, we're also going to have a time to extend the conversation on some deeper issues. So welcome. We hope that you'll stay with us. Uh, Jillian Ahmed, what's going on? How y'all doing today? Good, yeah, how are right? you doing? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I mean, I understand that uh, people have been buzzing about this whole... Cigarette? Electronic cigarette scenario. Yes, people have been buzzing everywhere about it, including the New York Times. So essentially, there's what they're calling a social networking device for smokers. Um, did you read about it, Jillian? Yeah, yeah, this is really strange. I guess it allows, uh, it's got some sort of some sort of device in it that allows people to find each other while they're using these electronic cigarettes. Yeah, so, so this is what I understand. It, this is from someone who's never smoked a cigarette in life. Right. Like, uh, what's the point? I mean, you're already going from trying to get people to stop smoking. Now they still kind of want to smoke, mm -hmm. but they prefer to smoke digitally or I guess. Well, and then, you know, now they want to know who else is doing it too. <laughs> I, as the Arab in the room, I feel like I'm speaking with authority. This is so sad. Well, um, the smoke, I mean, well, former smoke. Well, I think the whole yeah. concept, yeah, is that you're trying to appeal to the social sensibility of a smoker. And so uh -huh. a lot of people, when they quit, obviously they're happy for their health, but they miss the social aspect of smoking, right? Yeah, so, right. yeah but, but then they don't have to stand in the smoking section. They can stand in the regular section with everybody else. Yeah, I mean, I you guess can stand wherever you want because it's electronic. So there's no actually, no there's no smoke. even though there's a little smoke, it's really vapor. And to be honest, I'm not sure of the, the specifics. But what we should emphasize is the whole uh -huh. point is the concept is if I'm smoking, somehow the device will alert me to whether someone is close to me who's also using the same device. So obviously, it's also a marketing tool. I mean, yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're marketing them yeah, for clearly. on sale next month uh, for eighty dollars um, for five e-cigarettes, wow. which 80? lasts much longer though. Yeah, there's like a blue light. It's like tech, you know, it's the future and whatnot. Yeah. So it's a nicotine vapor. Cigarettes. So I love this. I, One guy called it uh -huh. the dumbest thing he's ever heard. Yeah, that. Well, I, you know, hey, <laughs> you know, not, not to put too fine a point on it, but I'm like, look, if I, um, first of all, am mm. standing next to a nicotine vapor smoker, right. am I going to be engaging or imbibing some of this nicotine no. vapor? No. Do I have to wor worry about secondhand vapor? I am not an expert on this cigarette. No, but honestly, I, I think the entire concept. What, what, what kind of stuck out to me is like they're trying to capitalize on what seems to be this really, uh, you know, really kind of r trendy thing, which is using social media to connect people, yeah. whether to like overthrow the yeah. government or to yeah. smoke a cigarette. So, yeah, uh, je ne sais I pas. If, I wonder if there's oh. any sort of secret, uh, you know, connections that can be made using this cigarette. I mean, you're in, you know, you're in Cairo, you're trying to start uh, yeah. a new revolution. <laughs> yeah, so, you're you know, where's, the, where's the closest smoke? It's like a discreet way of connecting yeah, yeah. people. Um, but on a more serious note, uh -huh. there's other issues about. Wait, are we going to talk about your post, or do? You? No, I want to. We're definitely going to talk yeah. about it because yeah. uh, you wrote something really dynamic in the on Al Jazeera's website right now, an op-ed. So we're going to talk about that in the post show. Okay. But during the main show, we'll give you get you a chance to give a little tantalizing tidbit about what that piece is about. That but sounds great. I want to save it. Yes, let's you know save what I'm it. Saying. Okay, my mistake. <laughs> we're saving it. All right. We'll see. Now, oh, there, there was something, though, that I saw that was super hot, um, and I don't have a, I'm trying to find a good link to it, but, like, the Atlantic Wire, oh, yeah. um, basically, the Atlantic Wire did a story about the blogger that we had on from Egypt the other day, right? Uh, Hamlawi. They basically, Hassan, um, but, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, they did a story okay. about how he's how renewing he's, his, yeah, right. renewing his, uh, his, you know, campaign against right. Flickr. Flickr effectively, he created Piggypedia. Flickr there basically, you know, uh, said that for se copyright reasons, they had to take down well, some of their copyright. images. It wasn't copyright. It wasn't copyright. They said Flickr users have to um, mm -hmm. own the content that they put up, so it wasn't a legal but copyright that, issue. Well, right that, here, but, but right? that, they, it this still comes it. in kind yeah, of under, it. yeah, exactly. Well, so the, it still seems to me like it comes under copyright terms because they're like, well, you don't, you're not the owner, you're not the copyright holder, therefore we have the right to force you to take it yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's very, definitely very similar. Yeah, yeah. and well, and when, when we talked to him on Monday, he was saying, well, um, I, I mean, who does own this stuff? Right. Right. Who is the owner of this material right. but the Egyptian people? Right. And so, in a nutshell, he's had this whole campaign to out security forces, people who've committed torture and have beat protesters and different people. His site has been up since 2008. Atlantic Wire just did a story on them. We saw it this morning. And they did it because if you look at that last line, right, it says, uh, blah, blah, blah. It, this is what happened on Monday when Egyptian journalist and labor activist Hossam El-Hamlawi 
uh, accused Flickr of censoring his Pigipedia account in an appearance on Al Jazeera's The Street. Oh, right, so, so apparently people are taking the cues. Apparently there people are go. taking the cues from The Street. We are exposing the issues and the media is uh, expanding on it. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, he's obviously accused Flickr of censoring his Pigipedia account before. But, you know, even during the show, it's worth noting um, that he actually... We actually showed some of the images on Flickr of those oh, people. Okay, Obviously, good. we blurred out their faces. Yeah, but, yeah. But um, so you know, some of those photos are on Flickr. I guess they censored other others, uh, some of the other ones. Maybe the ones that he had on before. I think yeah. I think he's put them up somewhere else now. So I think they're on yeah. his website, hosted Wikipedia, somewhere right. outside of yeah, yeah. And here they actually have yeah, a he, video. This is the video of them storming the oh, right. state security. Um, which you know, speaking of state security, I know that you. Have you, you've uh, done a lot of work, obviously. You're working now at the EFF, so you're doing a lot of work about how countries are using yeah, the internet. Yeah, yeah, well, I've, I've definitely, I've done a little bit of work on this, too. Um, I was actually at a, at a conference around the time that this happened, and I was doing a panel, um, you know, this was kind of just the best timing ever. I was speaking about how companies, social media, uh, social networks are censoring uh, activists right. in a lot of cases. Mm. And this topic came up, and, um, uh, the the Arabist blogger uh, right. happened to be at the conference and raised his hand and said, you know, I'm actually the one that paid for this account, and here's what happened. We had the woman from Flickr, uh, their policy, yeah. um, I don't know her exact title, but their policy director, uh, yeah. Abelia Kobe Harris, and she was on screen during this happening, and so we had all of this uh, back and forth about it. Yeah. And ultimately, While you know, they were storming the state security? Uh, no, 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 this was when, when his uh, photos were taken account. down. Okay, sorry, okay. Yeah, but I mean, the thing that's interesting about it is like, you know, we typically think of censorship in terms of government. Right. But we've discussed a few times on the program that it doesn't always break it down that way and yeah. I mean when so much of our lives mm -hmm. is impacted by the private sector mm -hmm. is there any responsibility of that private sector to adhere to these ideas of free, free speech exactly and legally there really isn't and so it's really up to companies to to sort of take human rights into consideration you know yeah. there are people working on this and you've got like the global network initiative and other sort of organizations that are kind of trying to make this happen but I mean generally there's there's just no rule yeah. Well, it looks like we're about uh, 20 seconds out. We're going to be down into the real show, so we're going to keep our powder dry for that. This is definitely going to be an interesting one. If you've been joining us here in the pre-show, in a few seconds we're going to be going live uh, to our entire TV audience, so we'll be talking to you then. Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream, a social media community with its own daily TV show. We're bringing you the stories that are ongoing global and sourced from social media. Today, Russia's most celebrated anti-corruption crusader. Or is he a clever opportunist? And Nairobi Knights, a Kenyan sex worker, blogs about her experiences. As always, we're here with our digital producer, Ahmed Shihab el -Din. And also joining us on the couch is writer and activist Jillian York, who works on a range of issues related to human rights and freedom of expression. Jillian, welcome to the stream. Thank you for having me. Now, we understand that you just took a new position at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Yes. Tell us what kind of stuff you'll be doing there. Well, so I'm going to be directing their international freedom of expression efforts, so looking at um, government-level censorship, as we were just talking about, and corporate censorship, and all sorts of other issues that, that fall in that category. Wow, and I understand that you wrote a piece for Al Jazeera's website on I this. I did, yeah. I just put up a piece um, called Africa's Cascade of Internet Censorship, looking at, you know, we hear a lot about North Africa, we hear about Morocco and Egypt and their censorship of the Internet, but we don't hear a lot about Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. and so I looked at Ethiopia, Burundi, and a couple of other countries to see what's going on there. That's excellent. So we're going to dive deep into that during the post-show. So for our viewers who are tuning in on television, after the show, we're going to be coming back online. You can join the conversation. In the meantime, check out Jillian's piece right there on Al Jazeera's page. Ahmed, what kind of stuff have we been seeing in the stream? Well, speaking of censorship, let's start with a tweet that came from Saxif. And he is telling us about a blog that he's written that's based on an AFP article. Uh, he says, behind the scenes of Thailand's cyber scouts. So if we go to the, the blog that he's written right here, essentially what's happening is he is one of several dozens, uh, not the guy who tweeted us, but the, you know, the article is chronicling one of several dozens of volunteers that have been recruited by the government 
by the Justice Ministry essentially to, uh, to troll the internet and report offenses. And now, if they find someone and someone's charged, what's incredible right here you can see is that the offense could lead up to 15 years in prison. Wow. And if we go forward just a little bit, one of the quotes from no, wait, one of the what students... What kind of offenses are they talking about? Like Basic stealing online or? No, it's basically if you're publishing information, uh, it's right here. It says, you know, sometimes these are just fun conversations, but it's anything that's deemed offensive by Thailand's revered monarchy, so by the justice wow. system. Right, and in Thailand they've got that issue online of les majestes, right? So if you if you do anything um, to insult Wait, wait, the please explain les majestes. Oh, oh no. those of us who are not <laughs> legal scholars. I don't know if I'm going to get this one right. Go um, for it. Basically in Thailand, if you say anything um, online or offline to uh -huh. insult the royal family, um, yeah. that is a punishable offense, you can be thrown in jail for that. Okay. And so there have been a number of cases of bloggers um, being arrested for that very Okay, act. so wow. let's just go to the next feedback section so we can catch up. There's one, this is the website right here, uh, the Cyber Scout website in Thailand, so where people are actually Ooh. doing the reporting. But let's go to a tweet now that came from Al Hurra 24 that says, Jordan and Morocco to join the GCC. Now, they're linking to a press TV article, but we're just gonna pull up this Global Voices article right here, as you can see, Arab World, the club for Arab monarchies to get Morocco and Jordan. And so this is the, basically the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council. Yeah, the Gulf Cooperation Council was founded in 1981. So its members are Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, and the UAE. This started what seemed to be a rumor. A lot of people thought it was a rumor. This couldn't possibly be happening yeah. that these two countries were going to join. But as we can see, lots of people have been tweeting about it, including the UAE colonist Sultan Al Qasimi. And he's saying basically the GCC is turning into a club for, for Arab monarchies. And uh, there's one more tweet right here where Muna Abu Suleiman is saying that this is a big lesson to Egypt. She's saying they have rendered the Arab League obsolete. Well, well said. People are keeping a lot of interesting things coming to us, obviously. Uh, remember, if you want to share your stories with the stream community, tweet us directly at AJStream. We're relying on you, our online community, to help keep us informed. All right, I'm Alexis Ohanian, co-founder of Reddit. Presently, the head of marketing at Hitmonk and chief swine defender at Breadpig, and I am in the stream. Russia is considered to be one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Bribery, kickbacks, and embezzlement are estimated to have cost the Russian economy more than $400 billion last year. One man who's been very visible in the fight against corruption is lawyer and activist Alexei Navalny. Yet there are many in, in Russia who question his motives. This is a gentleman who is 34-year-old blogger, in a nutshell. He used to be a part of an opposition liberal party, which he was asked to leave. But the thing that has gotten so much attention is he started out by blogging about different kinds of corruption among Russian officials. Well, he most recently uh, created a new site called Raspil, which basically enables anyone, not just him, but any member to go on and look at Russia's process for awarding government contracts and to say, hey, we see a discrepancy here or we see a discrepancy there. So now the controversy is, on the one hand, a lot of people see this guy as a hero, somebody who is not only uh, targeting the issue of corruption in the Russian system, but also empowering other people to do so. But then there are others who are saying, well, he's just doing this to, you know, forward his own political gain. In order to get deeper into this story, we uh, decided to bring two people to join us now. Uh, via Skype, we've got Ivan Bechtin, who's been fighting corruption in Russia through his blog. And also with us is Anton Nasik, who's an influential member of Alexei Navalny's website, Rospil. They're both in Moscow. Great to have you, both of you gentlemen in the stream. Good evening. Okay, Anton, I want to actually start with you. Uh, I understand that you work closely with Alexei. Tell us a little bit about... Uh, what is the benefit of Rospil, or what it, um, impact it's having on the ground? Well, this is a monitoring website that collects information about suspicious government acquisitions and tenders and uh, employs uh, a number of lawyers and uh, special interest experts who file formal complaints against uh, those, uh, those tenders. And those complaints over the last three months have already led to cancellation of tenders, of seven tenders, in the overall amount of uh, 337 million Russian rubles, which is roughly 12 million U.S. dollars. And so when you and say the cancellation of those tenders, you mean that the government puts out a contract, basically, a bid for contract, but what you are doing through Rospil is identifying where money may be potentially misappropriated, is that correct? 
Absolutely. There are many ways of misappropriating money. For instance, it's buying a luxury car for a very poor college uh, to drive its, uh, its uh, deal. Uh, on the other hand, it could be an acquisition for millions of rubles or even millions of dollars of some obscure, uh, undefined software piece, which probably doesn't even exist. And there are some tenders in which it is specified that this piece of software costing millions should be developed within one week. Then it's pretty obvious that it wouldn't be developed at all, that it has been pre-existing. Got you. Well, so now, Ivan, um, can you talk to us? Because we understand that your work is also dealing with anti-corruption. How does your blog uh, or your own work, how is it similar or different from Alexi's? Um, I'm uh, researching uh, Russian procurement and uh, open government data for the uh, last uh, two years. And uh, about two years ago, I found um, um, uh, contracts uh, for... Uh, um, three to two millions of rubles, it's a billion of rubles, uh, which were cancelled by Federal Anti-Monopoly Service. Uh, it was a result of um, uh, lots of government procurements. Um, government uh, customers used to um, transliterate uh, some words to use mix of Russian and Latin letters to hide uh, several bits. And um, I'm ongoing my research and created Russian uh, government um, monitoring procurement portal, Rospending.ru. It's uh, very similar to uh, lots of other world initiatives in this area, like USAspending.gov, like um, you know, monitoring of Open College so Foundation I, Ivan, in let Europe. Me, let me ask you more directly. Uh, it sounds like you're also very focused on the anti-corruption issue. How does your work, or uh, it seems like you and Alexei, uh, would be natural allies, is that correct? Uh, no, that's completely not correct. Um, I am working mostly not on anti-corruption issues, I am working on uh, open data. Okay. And uh, anti-corruption is one of the results of open data. And uh, Alexei Navalny, for my opinion, he uh, is very harmful for Russian civil society. Since instead of creation of uh, something that could be more explained um, uh, to explain people what is government procurement, what is corruption, what is hymns. Instead, he tries to judge uh, some topics of government procurement that he doesn't understand completely. And, now, now, uh, let, let, you... me, let me give Anton a minute opportunity to jump in here, because Anton, we know that you work on this project with Alexei on Rossville. Um, uh, basically, Ivan is saying that, well, maybe that project is not giving people an opportunity to understand the issues that are at stake with corruption. Would you, what would you say to that? Ivan must have a strong point here <clears throat> that he is an expert and thousands of people who support Navalny, both with their money and with their uh, physical efforts and with their time and with their activism, are not experts like Ivan and will not become ones because they have different education, because uh, they have a different background and they're specialists in some other field. But apart from that, there are also Russian taxpayers who want to know how their taxpayers' money is spent. And this is where uh, Navalny gives them the opportunity to participate, to act as responsive, mm, responsible citizens, to, mm, to have their say, finally, because before Navalny came, what Ivan does, he does behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. He hasn't been doing a great job evangelizing his Well, activity. Anton, let me actually jump on that point, and then I want to get uh, some feedback from Jillian. But the argument that some have made is that Navalny is doing this in order to raise his own political profile. How would you respond to those allegations? Um, I wouldn't call that allegations. It's pretty obvious that if a person does something that draws attention of, um, of many people, that uh, encourages uh, activism, of course, that person himself becomes popular. Okay, but, uh, it, I, I want to get... Noted, oh, sorry, go ahead. It should be noted that Navalny is not running for any office. He's not a candidate uh -huh. in any of the upcoming elections, not local, not federal, not presidential, not parliamentary. So, this, uh, this should be noted. So, Jillian, here's an interesting situation because yeah. you're basically having an argument from what it sounds like where one party is saying, well, we can kind of 
crowdsource this ability to identify corruption within our communities. Another party is saying, well, you know, you've got to have certain expertise in order to be able to identify what is really corruption. I mean, how do we think about these sorts of things? Right. Well, I mean, it seems to me, and I, I, I I think that, you know, it, it seems like they're working sort of toward the same goal, but you're looking at two different approaches, a more yeah. traditional one and a more sort of grassroots um, activist one. And, you know, I mean, I, I actually think that both approaches are probably, uh, you know, complementary to one another. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear that there's so much. Uh, yeah, it, it would seem to be. Uh, Ahmed, you, I see you've got some interesting things on your screen. Yeah, it's just worth pointing out that, uh, you know, Russia ranks, I don't know if you mentioned this, that, that it's ranking according to the Corruption's Perception Index, which is ranking corruption mm -hmm. worldwide out of 178 countries right here. I don't know if you could see, Russia ranks 154. at 154. So clearly corruption is rampant. But according to the Global Voices, there's this article that is saying that the reaction amongst Russian bloggers is that a lot of netizens consider him to be a knight in shining ar armor, but however, if we look at the actual traffic going to his website, um, you know, right here with this graph, you notice that uh, the traffic to uh, his website, Rospil, is going down and declining, has been declining since February. Well, so this brings up an interesting point, and I'm going to come back to you, Anton, and then Ivan, I'm going to let you jump in in a sec. Anton, one of the things that we've been reading is that Navalny is an uh, avowedly a uh, very nationalistic figure. He has had some YouTube videos that have spoken very in denigrating terms about immigrants. And do you believe that some of his political beliefs may draw or be drawing away from his popularity uh, with his anti-corruption campaigns? I think that the entire issue of Navalny's nationalism has been uh, artificially uh, raised by uh, the exact people he is accusing of uh, fraud and funds embezzlement. And uh, if we are talking about factual background here, it's true that five years ago, uh, Alexei Navalny used to participate in, in an organization that uh, he himself called nationalist. But that has been five years ago. And over the last five years, I haven't heard any race, uh, racist or, uh, or biased uh, comment that would justify discussing this issue now. I want to get a response then from, I want to get a response then from Ivan. Ivan, Anton is saying that, look, Alexei is doing work that's empowering regular people to work against corruption and that any allegations of him being a nationalist are old. How would you respond? Um, I don't know anything about uh, Alexei, uh, political background, uh, is he nationalist or not. To be honest, I'm completely not worried about that. Uh, all I'm worried about is that he is completely not professional way that he tries to monitor government contracts and uh, talking about uh, civil engagement and people who attract, um, uh, whom he attracts, uh, there is a problem. And the problem is that um, it's not a civil activity. Activity. activity for lots of people who just hate government, who just completely distrust, and for them, is uh, Alexei Navalny is a showman. He appears from nothing, and uh, actually, it's not crowdfunding of civil uh, project. It's crowdfunding of uh, uh, people show. Alexei Navalny shows uh, show this uh, uh, show go on. It's every day and uh, um, on nonstop. He never writes something explainable. He never uh, writes uh, how uh, detailed he, uh, for example, determined uh, government procurement. Which are so I'm sorry, Ivan, are you saying then that the allegations he's making are not substantiated? Uh, I don't think that any of these obligations are a problem. The problem is different, that when you try to criticize Alexei Navalny anywhere, uh, lots of his uh, fun, uh, fun people, uh, he has a, a great fun club, uh, appear from nowhere and starts commenting why you are talking about he's our hero and you are nothing okay it's very common th th for th any uh, ivan i i just need to give anton an opportunity to respond to that but thank you for that anton uh is your colleague are you and your co uh colleagues open to criticism uh, absolutely absolutely this uh, all this mm, true. all all claims by alexei navalny uh -huh. are subject to argument and there are uh, big and serious forces and big money 
behind denigrating Mr. Navalny. So you know, I want to thank you both. I'm sorry, we've run out of time on this subject. This is obviously something we're going to have to be keeping tabs on and following up on, but I really appreciate you both joining us from Moscow to give some insights. Thank you, Anton, and thank you, Ivan. Thank you. Uh, this is really interesting to me, and again, I want to come back to you, Jimmy, and in this case, because from the outside perspective, mm -hmm. it sounds like they should be natural allies, yeah. but clearly there's a real concern that is bubbling up underneath all of this. Well, you know, I mean, one of the, on the in the Starify story, somebody had mentioned, you know, that he's kind of the, like, the Julian Assange of Russia, and, yeah. and I, to me, that seems a little bit of what, what's happening with that debate, is you've got sort of the establishment way of, of doing things, and yeah. then the sort of grassroots, you know, just go for it, activist kind of way of doing yeah. things and so I think that's where the tension lies but you're right I mean I do think that it would make well, sense for them I to think be I think it's also interesting that they didn't that the uh, you know uh, Ivan did not have any comment to say about his nationalism but from the outside a lot of people have been writing significant critiques about hey this guy is pushing what some would argue are racist ideas now we don't know where he stands on this because right. like they said he's not running right. for office right. I think it's going to be something we have to keep our uh, eyes on and we'll see how it evolves as they lead up to elections. Ahmed, uh, any quick feedback online? Yeah, we have one person, uh, Hamam Etsu, is telling us essentially that uh, corruption, this is a broad statement, is created by rich countries to suck the natural resources from poorer countries. So he's uh, coming out against globalization and capitalism. Well, I mean, it seems in this particular case, Russia is arguably a rich country, but the corruption seems to be sucking away from the lives of the people right there. And I think that's something worth considering whenever we're talking about rich or poor countries. Mm -hmm. And remember, if you have anything you want to contribute to the conversation, you too can join the stream. I'm founder and editor-in-chief of Asia Plus Media Group, and I'm part of the stream. We've all heard about the risks sex workers face in their line of work, and now one such woman in Kenya is offering us a rare insight into her world by blogging about how she handles both the physical and its psychological demands. This is the story of a website, a blog called uh, Nights in Nairobi, and in a nutshell, this woman, who goes by the name Sue, uh, is basically telling the story of what it's like to be a prostitute on the streets of Nairobi. Now, in order to give some real insight into this, we're lucky to have joining from us from Nairobi, Sue herself. We can't show you her face in order to protect her identity, but Sue, uh, we want to thank you and welcome to the stream. Thank you. So, Sue, uh, your, your blog is very interesting. There are some really compelling elements of it. Jillian has been looking at some. I'm going to ask Jillian to read a, a little excerpt from your blog, and then I want to dive into a few questions. Sure, yeah. So um, this quote okay. just really is fantastic. Um, she writes, I have written about what society expects a prostitute to be. To some extent, it is true, but interaction with prostitutes is so businesslike and at times in not sober circumstances. This does not provide room for men to gauge the prostitute intellectually. So I, I found that really, really interesting. Yeah, um, well, and, and that I, I would agree. Uh, Sue, we don't usually think of prostitution and intellect in the same sentence, but what you're doing online is really shifting the way people are considering the nature of sex work. What moved you to start this blog? Sue, can you still hear us? I think we're, we're having some slight audio troubles with uh, Sue's feed. We're going to try to fix that, and, and I think we'll get some feedback once we get her back online. But I'll tell you one thing. That definitely the thing that caught me about her writing is how articulate it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's obviously a very educated woman. So one of the things that I wonder about is we think of prostitution or sex work and poor people, but this is someone who um, is apparently had opportunity, yet she finds herself in this particular field. How do you think about, you know, the choices that people make if prostitution is not simply a matter of poverty, but of choice? Yeah, I mean, she wrote about, um, I think it was uh, coming out of college and not being able to find a job. Uh, she says, you know, that she made a few applications, didn't wait for all the responses, and then went to the, the SJ, I, I assume that's where one goes, uh, to become a prostitute. And she said, courtesy of my ego and the reality of the work, I would be hesitant to say I was destined to be a prostitute, or worse still, admit that I choose prostitution because I was lazy, wanted freedom, and having it easy. But, you know, I mean, it does seem like... Uh, a choice in this case, a career choice that, uh, you know, earned her the kind and of money that she And it's sad because there are a lot of people who don't get a chance to make that choice. I mean, while we were researching this story, we found that a number of young women in areas where 
um, they've had flood, like drought or, mm -hmm. or any kind of thing that has messed with the food supply and local economies, right. that these young girls have been turning to prostitution right. and going to city centers like Nairobi. There's one, uh, we're reading that there were 12 year olds that are engaging in this and they're being, uh, you know, charging maybe a dollar, being paid a dollar a night. So I think we have Sue back on the line. Can okay. you hear us now, Sue? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Hi. Hey, we were just speaking about how articulate your writing is. Uh, wanted to understand, you're obviously an educated person. Why did you get involved in prostitution and what moved you to launch this blog? Um, well, well, what I call the blog is, is Nairobi Nights, a diary of a Kenyan prostitute trying to build a, bland, a brand. And um, why, why I'm blogging is, is because I really, at some point, wanted to, to see how, how I could engage an audience of, of uh, what we... I think on the street we refer to them as regular people, you know, your um, quote-unquote normal members of your community, women who you expect to go to church and to be active and to, to find in the market. And when people think of sex workers, they think of us differently. Um, you, you think of a woman on the streets, uh, scantily dressed and um, bad makeup. So I, I just wanted to, um, to bring together the experiences that I've had in my work um, with with my my society and my community and just to show that i'm i'm not particularly different from anyone else and you're you're right i do have a relatively good education and um i've had uh, so more or less the same uh, opportunities as many people so i'm sorry we've got an interesting question coming in online uh, Ahmed, could you share yeah we have a question coming from yal bash on twitter they're curious to know whether you would be willing to pay taxes in case the government legalized your trade um, I would, I would absolutely. I, I, I pay taxes for my roads. I pay taxes when I go to the store to buy groceries. I, I would be willing to pay taxes. Yes. Sir. Okay. Now, Sue, there's some interesting questions that I think come up with this issue of legalization, and we want to come back to them again. But so, Jillian, you're obviously uh, hearing something that we wouldn't normally catch. What, what's your take on this whole idea of an empowered, educated woman? pursuing this particular path. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm intrigued. As you mentioned, you've got a lot of women who are forced into this around the world, but then on the other hand, you do have a lot of people who choose the profession. And I think that, you know, we tend to view that, that other side of prostitution, but really mm -hmm. we should be viewing the whole picture and realizing that for many, this is a choice. Absolutely. So we're going to continue this conversation. Sue, I'm going to ask for you to hold for us, for our audience that's joining us on television. Unfortunately, that's the end of our TV time with you. However, we will be continuing this conversation online. We're looking forward to talking to you. Join us at stream.aljazeera.com. You can also tweet us at AJStream. We will see you online. Hey, welcome back. This is The Post Show. We're going to continue our conversation with Sue. She's a sex worker in Nairobi. She has a blog called Nairobi Nights. She's giving us the inside scoop on what it's like to be in her profession. And uh, we want to continue a little bit more with us. Sue, are you still with us? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, Sue, so, you know, one of the things we're just decide talking about is, and Jillian made the great point, that sometimes we think of prostitution in terms of poverty, but it's also a choice. What led you to make this particular choice? And how do you feel it's... Um, you know, have been the rewards and the risks with it. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see the rewards and the risks within my job as any different from um, any other woman working in Nairobi. Um, I, 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 I don't see a significant difference apart from the fact that a lot of people would not have chosen this path. Um, I, I, I was lucky enough to have to have been raised in a way that was open-minded and. And I, I was allowed the opportunity to pursue a different way to make to make my living because we all have to make a living, and it was it was a way that was efficient. For me. Now, is your I, I, I managed to live a relatively good life. Now, you mentioned the way that you were raised. Like, is your family aware of what you do? Um, no, for the most part, they aren't. Some members are. Um, I, I was raised in, in your typical African home, uh, a Christian household, and mm -hmm. um, I, I doubt that anybody would have expected me to go down this way. 
to go uh, down this path. Sue, so before uh, our TV portion of the program ended, we asked you about legalization and you said you would be willing. However, uh, on April, yes. I'm just curious if you could elaborate a little bit about this, uh, because on April 28th, you wrote a blog post actually about the issue of legalization and about joining the system. Yes. You said that, um, as the activist put it, legalization means freedom in capital letters. It means the end to police and city council askari harassment. But then you say, at the face of it, legalization seems like the best thing that can happen to our industry, what with us being treated with dignity and all. However, in your opinion, as you said, the obvious advantages of legalization are insignificant as compared to the disadvantages. So what are some of those disadvantages? Um, the, the main disadvantages, I, I think, of formalizing the industry would be um, that, that the costs would, would be high, would become higher. Um, we, we manage within our industry to separate um, different levels of, of sex work um, so that it's, it's, it's a service that's affordable to just about any client base. And I consider myself a member of the service industry. I, I like to please my clients. Um, so, so that's one of the main things that, that it will be, t I, I think it would lead to uh, a black market demand for prostitution because of the, ri the rise in costs. Um, but on, on the other hand, I'm happy to pay tax, and, and, and I think it would make the streets much safer for, for, many, for, for many girls who are in the same situation, for many sex workers. Um, but also it will, it will make sure that, for example, um, we talked about 12-year-old girls. We will make sure that girls like that will be able to, to be back in school, and they won't, they won't necessarily be allowed to engage in such practices, because I, I don't think um, it's right for children. So um, how, yeah, do you, how do you think about risks such as HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases? Hello? Sorry. I was asking about how do you consider the risk of HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases? Uh, I think the risks are significant. I think the risks are significant and um, no matter if, if, if you're, you're having commercial sex or you're in a relationship, those are risks that you assume <clears throat> as, as soon as you become sexually active. Um, okay, so, and, now, oh, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. We, no, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. and, um, yes, and I, I, think, I think a significant, a significant function of, of my blog is um, bringing sexuality to the forefront and, and making us more open about talking, uh, to, towards talking about issues of, of using protection condoms and HIV testing, um, because this is this is obviously a significant part of our generation's experience, sexual experience. Julian, this is um, a, in it, Africa, especially we are we are blighted by by the possibility of infection. Every time, every day I go to work, this is something I think about. Mm. Julian, this is uh, interesting because basically you're we think a lot of times about something like the sex trade, and we're like, yo, this is problematic morally, health-wise, right. etc. But she's raising the point that through her own uh, raising of her voice through her blog, she's creating a dialogue. Yeah. How do you balance that issue? I mean, maybe is raising a dialogue a helpful way towards coming to more healthy sexual relationships as well as dealing with some of these public health concerns? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, that's a really interesting question. I'm actually, um, I'm really curious to ask if I might, uh, you know, how many of your readers are coming from within Kenya? Um, I, I think I think a, a vast majority um, of my readers. I, I have had a good bit of interest from overseas, but a, a, a lot of them and a lot of the people who respond to the blog are are Kenyan people who quite likely I have passed on the street, people who grew up in the same society as me. Uh, Sue, one of the comments on your blog from Easy right here is uh, one of the users. I'm not sure if you've read this one. Um, says that he's now a bit disappointed, he or she. What started off as a fun blog is slowly turning into what seems more and more like a philosophical tool. What would you say to that? Um, well, well, like, like I said uh, at the beginning, the, the, the first thing, and that's why I, I say it very clearly, at the, at the, uh, the byline of Nairobi Nights is that I'm, I'm building a brand. And the initial stage of building a brand, um, as far as I remember, is, is, is establishing a fan count. And, and the next stage is engagement. So I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the point that my blog is mature enough that I want to challenge negative stereotypes, but at the same time um, challenge the so-called politically correct narratives that, that, we, um, that we insist on in, in talking about uh, bad sexuality and, and sex work. 
there's, there's some a very, lot of myths going around. There's some really interesting questions that are coming to us online too, and we want to present a few more of them to you. Ahmed has got some stuff that's coming in via Twitter. A lot of them are actually about your kind of motivations or your consciousness to get into this line of work. And Johnny Brave is asking whether, he says, did Sue get into her line of work as a long-term goal or was it a temporary plan that is extended over time? Because I've read in your blog you, you suggest that you might eventually come out, so to speak, to your yeah. parents and stop doing this. Um, yes, yes, I, I, I engaged, I, I entered the industry temporarily. I, I thought this is just going to be a thing, a thing that will get me out of bad situation. Um, but, but having, having, having worked over, over the years, um, I, I consider it to be a very reliable source of income and I'm a professional, so I, I carry myself with pride and, and, um, I, I can, I consider my clients with care. Um, but in the long term, it's, 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 it's like, uh, say, for example, models in the modeling industry. There's an expiry date. There's there's a limit to how um, how popular I will be in the future. There's a limit to what sort of clients I'll be able to draw. So I have to think about retirement at some point. So like wh what else. do you aspire to um, do in the future? Um, well, well, I've set myself on this path path as a writer. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I might I might proceed with that. Okay. Um, but a more practical option, I think, would be, given the experience that I have gained in, in the sex work industry, is, is possibly um, a venture into sexual rights or a, a venture into um, guide, guiding younger girls um, in, in, in terms of just encouraging girls to express their sexuality in a positive ways. So I, I, I reckon um, I could be in towards the, the, the role of a human rights uh, defender of some sort, a human rights activist on the periphery. Mm. Sue, thank you so much for joining us. The author of the Nairobi Nights blog. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us and elucidate more about your experiences. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So uh, this is, uh, you know, something that I need to take time to process. I mean, <laughs> yeah. the stuff she's talking about is mind blowing, and it's amazing that. The internet is really reframing the way people think about life and society around the world. I know, Julian, that you've been doing a lot about people's rights to access the internet, yeah. and particularly as it relates to Africa. Tell us a little bit about the op-ed you wrote today for Al Jazeera. Yeah, so um, I've been writing a column for Al Jazeera for a while now, and I look at internet freedom in different countries. Um, but what I've noticed is that um, while you know North Africa and the Middle East get a whole lot of attention in this space, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa really doesn't. And so I talked a bit about, um, you know, Ethiopia, for example, is one of uh, one of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that fairly pervasively filters the internet, um, spies on its users, and then you've got you know other sort of issues like in Uganda recently there were those walk to work protests um, protesting rising food and fuel prices and in light of that um, the Ugandan Communications Commission mm -hmm. had gone in and said that they were going to shut down Facebook and Twitter um, and yeah. we, we kind of confirmed that that happened on at least one ISP, internet service provider. Um, but yeah, I mean, people are really concerned that their government could be doing that. It's interesting that you mentioned that because during our pilot phase, we actually spoke to a Ugandan blogger right, who said yeah. that some of the ISPs had tried to do that, yes. but that the commercial factors, once people found out which ISPs were doing it, people, they spread the word and folks started driving to other ISPs. I'm wondering about what you can tell us about how these issues work between the elements of government control mm -hmm. and also as we spoke about earlier, the ideas of private sector censorship. Right, yeah. So, um, I mean, you've got a couple of issues there. One is that, you know, in many countries, the government has actual control over all of the ISPs. In some, it doesn't. It looks like Uganda is one of those places where it doesn't. Um, but as we were talking before the show, you know, you've got not just government censoring content, but then you've also got social networking sites like Facebook, like uh, YouTube, you know, and various others, Flickr as well, um, occasionally shutting down user content or shutting down user mm -hmm. accounts. Um, and so that's kind of a concern because we, we think of these places as being the public sphere but yeah. really they're they're not public one of our users is asking to kind of qualify the Uganda situation so maybe you can speak to that a bit sure. uh, Lutaya Sha, or Lutaya Shafiq is saying I really think that you should discuss our issues here in Uganda so this is from Uganda what is Uganda the Museveni and Besiji issues can mm. you speak to that a bit I, I can break it down yeah. in quick yeah. terms because we're running out of time in a nutshell rising fuel prices rising food prices mm. people were saying hey a lot of folks can't afford to drive to work in solidarity with the people we're all going to walk to work 
and this was uh, f um, started by one of these opposition le leaders, Besiji, Besiji. Right, right. but Museveni, who is the leader of the country, came down and they beat Besiji, they sent him to hospital, they shot him in his hand with a rubber bullet, uh, and they've been now, we showed yesterday, they've been spraying people with this pink stuff to show that they're protesters, but people are still rising up for their freedom there. Uh, we're going to keep our tabs on that and a number of things. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us online. We will be back again the same time tomorrow. Tweet us at AJStream. Actually, not tomorrow. We'll be here on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you then. <laughs>